I'm Polly Morris, the director of the Linden Sculpture Garden. Uh, one of the programs, major programs we run there is called Home. It's a program focused on the arts and culture of refugees in our community and also dis other displaced populations. But we also run the Knoll Fellowship uh, for Visual Artists and we love it when there's an intersection in our program. So Nina Gambarzada is a 2024 Knoll Fellow. So we're, we're happy to, to be supporting two programs with this. Back to Daniel. Thank you very much, Polly. Um, for more, you can go to the Linden Sculpture Garden website to uh, read more about all the wonderful programs they do. Um, we are so honored to have Kava Akbar here for his first novel, Martyr. Um, the book, as you well know, has been winning waves, including a front page New York Times book review. Lauren Graf called Martyr the best novel you'll ever read about the joy of language addiction, displacement, martyrdom, belonging, and homesickness. Um, John Green called it a brilliant and blisteringly alive novel, not just about how we go on, but also why. Clint Smith said, I can't remember the last time a book made me feel like this. And that's only from the authors I had read. Um, and then finally, uh, we have several big fans of the book on uh, staff, including this from Tim McCarthy, a smart novel from a powerful writer about fear, shame, loss, ego, addiction, and the possibility of arriving at moments of genesis. Um, Kaveh was born in Tehran and teaches at the University of Iowa. He drove here today, uh, just a note. And in the low residency MFA program at Randolph College and Warren Wilson. Um, he is the author of two poetry collections and a chapbook and the editor of Penguin Book of Spiritual Verse. Um, we are so honored um, to have him with in conversation with artist and Mary Knoll fellow, uh, Nina Gunbarzada, um, <laughs> who uh, is, uh, this is your first conversation. Um, we're so honored to have you here. It's such a wonderful match. Um, thank you both for coming. Please give them another hand. Thank you for this. Hi everybody! Welcome to this. Uh, it's not that it's not that terrible a drive. I, it's it's not as Herculean as it was made to sound. Um, it's it's a fairly easy shot on the highway. Thank you so much. For being here. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Um, hello everyone. Thank you for spending your Tuesday evening here at the Boswell Bookstore. It's actually my first time here, so I don't live in Milwaukee, so I had to drive from West. Uh, we both drove here. Drive. Yes, we both drive. So um, it's really an, really an honor to uh, have a conversation with you tonight. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, I have to say that I uh, read the book uh, the first time from an American perspective, like one, one side of me. Sure. Then I had to read it the second time um, to understand it from an Iranian point of view or perspective. So then I had to have conversation between you know these two to understand everything fully. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful book and I'm sure you're gonna love it. Um, and I absolutely uh, uh, recommend it. Um, so- um, should I read a few pages? Please so, do. Yeah. Yes. And then, and then we'll yes. Is, it, is that maybe I'll read like just for a couple minutes just to sort of season the air. Uh, yeah. And then uh, <laughs> did someone woo for seasoning the air? I love that. That's great. Uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just read the first couple pages of the novel. You don't need to know anything um, just generally, but this will sort of. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is great. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. This is wonderful. Um, yeah, these are just the first couple pages of the novel. Maybe it was that Cyrus had done the wrong drugs in the right order, or the right drugs in the wrong order. But when God finally spoke back to him after 27 years of silence, what Cyrus wanted more than anything else was a do-over. Clarification. Lying on his mattress that smelled like piss and Febreze, in his bedroom that smelled like piss and Febreze, Cyrus stared up at the room's single light bulb, willing it to blink again. 
willing God to confirm that the bulb's flicker had been a divine action and not just the old apartment's trashy wiring. Flash it on and off, Cyrus had been thinking, not for the first time in his life. Just a little wink and I'll sell all my shit and buy a camel. I'll start over. All his shit at that moment amounted to a pile of soiled laundry and a stack of books borrowed from various libraries and never returned. Poetry and biographies, To the Lighthouse, My Uncle Napoleon. Never mind all that, though. Cyrus meant it. Why should the Prophet Muhammad get to see a get a whole visit from an archangel? Why should Saul get to see the literal light of heaven on the road to Damascus? Of course, it would be easy to establish bedrock faith after such clear-cut revelation. How was it fair to celebrate those guys for faith that wasn't faith at all, that was just obedience to what they plainly observed to be true? And what sense did it make to punish the rest of humanity who had never been privy to such explicit revelation? to make everyone else lurch from crisis to crisis, desperately alone. But then it happened for Cyrus, too, right there in that ratty Indiana bedroom. He asked God, he asked God to reveal himself, herself, themself, itself, whatever. He asked with all the earnestness at his disposal, which was troves, if every relationship was a series of advances and retreats, Cyrus was almost never the retreater, sharing everything important about himself at a word, a smile, with a shrug as if to say, those are just facts. Why should I be ashamed? He'd lain there on the bare mattress on the hardwood floor, letting his cigarette ash on his bare stomach like some sulky prince, thinking, turn the lights on and off, Lord, and I'll buy a donkey. I promise I'll buy a camel and ride him to Medina, to Gethsemane, wherever. Just flash the lights and I'll figure it out, I promise. He was thinking this, and then it, something, happened. The light bulb flickered. Or maybe it got brighter, like a camera's flash going off across the street. Just a fraction of a fraction of a second like that. And then it was back to normal. Just a regular yellow bulb. Cyrus tried to recount the drugs he'd done that day. The standard bouquet of booze, weed, cigarettes, clonopin, Adderall, and Rotten. He had a couple Percocets left, but he'd been saving them for later that evening. None of what he'd taken was exotic, nothing that would make him out and out hallucinate. He felt pretty sober, in fact, relative to his baseline. He wondered if it had maybe been the sheer weight of his wanting or his watching that strained his eyes till they saw what they'd wanted to see. He wondered if maybe that was how God worked now in the new world. Tired of interventionist pyrotechnics like burning bushes and locust plagues, maybe God now worked through the tired eyes of drunk Iranians in the American Midwest, through CVS handles of bourbon and little pink pills with G31 written on their side. Cyrus took a pull from the giant plastic old crow bottle. The whiskey did, for him, what a bedside table did for normal people. It was always at the head of his mattress, holding what was essential to him in place. It lifted him daily from the same sleep it eventually set him into. Lying there, reflecting on the possible miracle he'd just experienced, Cyrus asked God to do it again. Confirmation, like typing your password in twice to a web browser. Surely if the all-knowing creator of the universe had wanted to reveal themselves to Cyrus, there'd be no ambiguity. Cyrus stared at the ceiling light, which in the fog of his cigarette smoke looked like a watery moon and waited for it to happen again. But it didn't. Whatever sliver of a flicker he had or hadn't perceived didn't come back. And so lying there in the stuffy haze of relative sobriety, itself a kind of high. 
amidst the underwear and cans and dried piss and empty orange pill bottles and half-read books held open against the hardwood, breaking their spines to face away, Cyrus had a decision to make. Um, I'm just going to start by asking this question. Um, um, how does it feel to be a successful writer and an artist? Um, did little Kabe knew that one day he would break it through and would travel state to state, city to city, and you know, meet people and talk about you know uh, his successful novel? And I'm asking this because there are many young artists out uh, struggling to make it through. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a generous question. Uh, when I discovered, so I came up as a poet. I have always thought of myself as a poet. Um, I discovered poetry when I was 14 or 15. Um, I had a seminal high school English teacher, like so many of us, and uh, who read a poem by the poet Yusuf Komanyaka in class. And I, it was called Facing It. And I was bowled over and I asked him if I could borrow the book. And he sent me home with that book and a stack of other poetry. And I remember I got home and read that book. It, it was called um, Neon Vernacular, the Yusuf Komanyaka book. And, uh, and I just remember opening it up and it was this utter shock of clarity. It was like the, this is what you are, you know, in fact, like it was so lucid that it was almost annoying. Like it was almost annoying that people had wasted my time teaching me, you know, like <laughs> geography or physics or, you know, like it was like, this is so obviously the thing that I am. And, you know, and, and, you know, I very quickly started living in the 811.5 section of my local library and came to understand that if I wanted a life in this thing, then that meant that uh, I would be living a life of tuberculin squalor, you know, you know, in a garret above a coal mine or something. Uh, and, and I was, I was thrilled with that, you know, that meant that I got to enter the ranks of these people and whisper into this conversation that has preceded me by millennia and will continue long after the last person forgets my name. And so the idea that, I don't know, I mean, like success, the success is a life spent in joyful humble service to that which you love best right and um and i love writing i love my recovery community i love my family and i am successful in that i get to you know spend my life in joyful humble service to those things um success in late capital late success in late capitalism means figuring out a way to get paid for what you'd be doing anyways um and and i have now gotten to that point in the past few years right um, and if that is the, it, yeah. And by that metric, um, no, but that was also never part of the equation. Like little Kava didn't dream of that, but little Kava never, like that wasn't part of it. You know what I mean? Like I knew that I was a poet the way that I knew I have like dark hair. You know what I mean? Like one doesn't think like, oh, well, if I can make enough money, I'll have dark hair. You know what I mean? Like I knew that I was a poet, right? Um, it was, it was mitochondrial. It was a part of me. Um, and whatever that meant, for everything else in my life, um, it didn't It was immaterial, right? I knew that I was a poet um, and whatever else happened was sort of ancillary to that sort of bedrock knowledge. Um, did you face any resistance from your parents in your house? Because <laughs> in Iranian culture, I have to say that kids are supposed to become either physicians or engineers yeah. and nothing in between, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you face any resistance? Yeah, of course. Um, hey, welcome. Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, I was, you know, until that point when I was given that book by, uh, by Yusuf Komanyaka, um, I was, you know, I was Indiana's top mathlete as a sophomore in high school, which was a very big deal. You know, uh, like I was like a very stereotypical Iranian nerd, like fast track to be a cardiologist or whatever, you know, um, I was on the math and science academic Super Bowl teams. And then I discovered poetry. And then shortly thereafter, I discovered drugs. And uh, and yeah, no one was worrying about me making, becoming a doctor anymore, you know? Um, uh, so I think it was, I mean, to be very honest, 
uh, my parents had much larger concerns than whether I was studying medicine or poetry, you know, um, I think that their concerns were more mortal where I was concerned. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with my story, and I've written about this extensively, it has the texture of like an intimate reveal, like it has the texture of something that I'm sharing with you, but it is actually like one of the most Googleable things about me. Um, I, uh, I, I am a person in recovery. I've been in recovery for like 10 and a half years, um, but it was pretty touch and go there for a second. Um, and so <clears throat> in those early years, my parents weren't like, what is your major or whatever, you know, they were like, are you alive? Like very literally, like I would go for long, long, long periods with that. And so, um, yeah, by the time I came back around and got sober and was alive, I was like, oh yeah. And also I'm a poet. And they were like, all right, all right, just don't like, you know? And so, um, it, it was sort of soften the blow a little bit. Well, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in one of your interviews with uh, Sharon Olds, uh, you said that, and I quote, my mom is American and my dad's Iranian. I basically spent two years in Iran speaking Farsi and kind of being spoken to in English. But when we moved to America, we spoke exclusively English in the house because they were dead set on Americanizing me, end quote. So how successful they were in their mission and um, I understand that Farsi is not your first language, but you sure you're good at it. Okay. And uh, have you found your identity? Because you sound like you have, but the struggle still is there in the book. It comes across. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, sure. So I do mean, you have like a few questions? You've really done your research. You're like looking up these. I mean, that conversation with Sharon Olds is probably like from... 2014 2015 um so yeah you're you're really prepared i have been on this and everything about you for the past at least a month we've full spent a time. lot of yeah. full time i'm grateful i'm grateful we've gotten to spend such good time together Absolutely. um and so we'll be able to do it corporeally too um yeah i mean so when we were in iran my mom's white my dad's iranian and uh she learned farsi and then went to iran with him uh, which was sort of, I mean, she's a weirdo. I don't know. Um, but, uh, and so they lived in Iran. I was born in Iran. Um, and then we came to America when I was a little kid. And so my predominant first language was Farsi. You know, my mom would speak to me in English occasionally, but mostly they were speaking Farsi in the house. My brother almost exclusively spoke Farsi. Um, he's seven years older than me. And so when we came to America, he was really struggling. He was in fifth grade when we came to America and he was really struggling in school. And so my parents banned speaking English in the household, like, or, I'm sorry, banned speaking Farsi in the household completely so as to accelerate his English language acquisition, which sort of makes sense, although it's actually bad um, English language learning pedagogy. But, uh, you know, this was this was not a time when people were having conversations about good ELL pedagogy. Um, uh, but uh, and so. Yeah, so our English, our, our our Persian sort of withered on the vine, right? Our, our Farsi sort of withered on the vine. Um, and it creates this thing where like, even talking to you, like I'm a little bit self, like when we, when you saw me there in the Starbucks, you like, you said like, Chitori, you know, like you, you said hello to me in yeah. Farsi. You said, how are you doing? And I sort of responded in Farsi, but I was really self-conscious about my accent. You know what I mean? Like in a room full of Iranian people, I feel like the least Iranian person. And in a room full of American people, I certainly have never felt American, you know? And so there's this sort of mm, liminality that exists, which is, you know, has been difficult at points in my living, but it's actually really powerful, I think, as an artist, because I'm sort of standing outside of every group, you know, and, and it's like, when you're inside a cloud, it's hard to describe a cloud, you know, but when you're stood on the ground, you're like, oh, that one's a giraffe, and that one's a circus tent, you know what I mean? Like, you, you can see the whole picture with some clarity. Um, and so I think it, the defamiliarist potential of the liminality of my various and sundry identities is useful to me as an artist, even as I continue to sort of make peace with it as a psycho spiritual consciousness. I just wanted to say that, believe it or not, I am self conscious when I'm uh, in a room full of 
English speaking people because there are certain words that I still have struggled pronouncing and I have to Google search few words to make the pronunciation. Well, but that means that you met them on the page. That means that you're a reader. That means you met those words on the page, right? You didn't hear them said to you. You met them on the page. That's that's always endearing to me. Like I, I remember my very first creative writing class in my undergrad. Um, it was taught by this uh, TA who went around and asked everyone who their favorite writers were. And everyone was like, JK Rowling or Stephen King or, you know, what, and, you know, I'm not yucking anyone's yum, but I was, I was like, so proud to, you know, mine, I had read every word he'd ever written, all of his letters. And she got to me and I was like, my favorite writer is Arthur Rimbaud, you know? And, uh, and my teacher was like, oh, sweetheart, it's pronounced Rambo, you know? And I felt about two inches tall, you know, like all the people who said like Stephen King or whatever, were like all puffed up because she'd been like, oh yeah, you ever read it or whatever? I don't know what she said, but uh, you know, uh, but uh, but like I, who had this poet that I'd love, like I, I wanted to learn French so that I could translate Rambo, you know, but I had never had occasion to say his name out loud to anyone. And so I had just spent all these hours reading it on the page, right? And so I, I, I say, say this to say, like I have a soft spot for people who say words wrong like they use them perfectly but they say them wrong because i know that that's someone who met that word on the page you know and so they're like more of my tribe you know or that's like an immediate like signifier that they're of my tribe yeah makes sense thank you um so your medium as an artist is words and language mm -hmm. uh what is your relation what's your relationship with language in general i'm wondering if with poetry um you felt like you needed more words to describe your struggles, your beliefs, challenges, figuring figuring things out, and etc. And I thought perhaps that was a motive for writing a novel. And how this transition happened. And when I was writing uh, the book, there were a couple of instances that you described that perhaps uh, language is not the medium, and maybe it was in one of your interviews that you specifically, you were talking about like using language to describe a tree, like a tree, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and people, you know, as much as you try, people may not understand, fully imagine or fully, uh, you know, understand the shape of the tree, but you take a picture and you show the picture and people get it, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and then in part of the book, you talk about like smells brings back memories but for cyrus it's language yeah. so i'm just wondering what is your relationship with language and what yeah is? yeah no i mean again a beautiful and very astute question and a question that's very much at the nucleus of my the whole you know atom of my curiosity is that how that metaphor has to end um uh yeah uh i you know Michelangelo looks out his window and sees the marble quarries. And so he works in marble and makes the David, right? Like right now, what we ha what we are utterly super saturated in is just like a fire hose of meaningless language just being shot at us from every in every corner. You know what I mean? Um, I, in this, met I don't mean to say that I am Michelangelo in this metaphor. I'm just saying like, <laughs> I'm just saying like, I, you know, like you, you know, like this is what this is what I am utterly, utterly you know, inundated by, right? Um, you know, you you have what is literally called an infinite scroll on your phone of just the language of empire cudgeling you into inaction, right? You see an ad for Dairy Queen and you see the Super Bowl score and then you see an autoplay snuff film of state murder of unarmed civilians and then you see, you know, a Marvel movie advertisement and then you see like someone's cat, right? And this is, you know, and all of this is language, is, is the, is empire training you, conditioning you to sort of, not digest your food, you know, not digest language, right? To forget that language has integrity and forget that language has meaning, right? To just sort of scan it and not have it come into you. Whereas like this, poetry slows down your metabolization of language, right? A novel slows down your metabolism. You read a novel more slowly than you read Twitter. You know what I mean? You read poetry more slowly than you read your Instagram. You know what I mean? And so there is something inherently potent just in the act of setting... Um, to go to the thing you were saying about the tree, I'm 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 also very interested in what language can't do, 
You know, I, I mean, if, you know, we, we're sort of yoked to this idea of humans having five senses, which is as arbitrary. I mean, we also have speech, right? We also have proprioception, right? Like any of these things can be um, thought of as senses. But I, if you think of language as a sense, right? Like, I mean, the book sort of talks about this too, but like compare us with what, like what is the next most advanced sense? Like compared to a dog, we can't smell anything, right? Compared to, uh, I don't know what animals hear good, what, but whatever, you know, like I, compared to a hawk, right? We can't see anything, right? But, uh, but compare us with, you know, a chimp who can say apple with her hands, right? And like, we're like, what we do with language is like several orders of magnitude past that. You know what I mean? Like we are the, the titans of language, right? And it's also this like inherently corrupt and corruptible invention, right? It is a technology, it is an invention. It's an invention that has been used in service of, I mean, the English language in particular has been used in service of ecological decimation and chattel slavery and indigenous genocide and the building and deployment of nuclear weapons and carrying us to the precipice of irreversible ecological collapse. I mean, like all of all of humanity's greatest hits. I'm serious. Like, and this is the same technology that I use to tell my nieces that I love them, right? This is the same technology that I use to make my art, right? So there's some amount of hmm, the Trinidadian Canadian poet M. Norbessa Philip talks about decontaminating language, right? Um, and that's the word that's coming to mind right now. Um, is there's some amount of decontamination that needs to take place. There's some acknowledgement. There's some amount mm, of needing to acknowledge the insufficiency of the medium to relay what I actually want. You know, if I want to talk about empire, or legacy, or martyrdom, or death, or nations, or family, or addiction, or recovery, like these are all, all of these things dwarf the representational capacity of the medium, right? And so um, the musician Brian Eno, uh, uh, has a not very good book called A Year with Swollen Appendices that has a really good line in it uh, where he says, um, I mean, it's just bloated. You know, it's like a, it could have been like a month with swollen appendices. But um, but uh, the uh, yeah, he's talking about like the crack in a blues singer's voice. And he's talking about I might have put this in the book. I, I've written so many drafts of the book that I forget which ones like which like bits actually make it in. But um, he's talking about the crack in like Sarah Vaughn's voice or Billie Holiday's voice or something, listening to them on a vinyl record. And he says, um, mm, the crack in her voice listening to this crack of her voice is like witnessing the sounds of emotional events too momentous for the medium assigned to record them listening witnessing emotional events too momentous for the medium assigned to record them right and if you think about any i mean like what do you want to write about love despair fear of death fear of godlessness fear of god right um any of these things right like, are far too momentous to just be like if i wrote fear of god on a sheet of paper and handed it to you right that's nothing right so like you have, there has to be some acknowledgement of the insufficiency of language, right? And I think poetry is really good at that because you, a person who comes into the poem um, understands that you're almost sculpting out of silence with language being the sort of negative, like, like language is sort of the flower thrown on the ghost of the thing, right? Uh, and I wanted to see if I could make a novel like that too, that would still read propulsively and still feel like an actual novel and not just like this nebulous miasma of like oracular bon mots, but like actually, you know, uh, like a novel that has propulsivity and momentum and plot. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it's not for me to say if it does that or not, but that's what I sort of said. I don't even remember what your question was. I just got excited. I think that, that was good enough, wasn't it? Thank you. Um, you just talked about insufficiency of, of language and um, that's understandable. But um, I remember in part of the book, uh, Cyrus is talking about words that um, humans invented language. Yeah. And he talks about, uh, we use words to describe things and people we give uh, names um, to things. And it was specifically, uh, Cyrus said that, uh, you call someone a Muslim and another person um, 
like Iran, one person is Iranian. Yes, Iran. yes, and so then how they stuff. start killing each other. And I, I just had to think about it for you know a few days. That was so powerful and so true. Like humans are humans, but as soon as you 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 start to describe them with adjectives and nouns, yeah. and that's how the conflict starts, right? Yeah. But I mean, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. Please, please, please. I mean, like, not to be myself, but like, there's no one in this room right now who isn't thinking about what's going on in Gaza. You know what I mean? Like, I I don't have one lobe of my brain for sitting here and talking about my book, and another one for thinking about the fact that like we're witnessing a generational genocide happening, and like we all just feel like utterly impotent, you know, in our capacity to do anything about it, right? And it's like you have these people sort of like nestled against each other right and and because of taxonomy i mean like genetically our genetic codes like you can find the two most discrete people on the planet earth and our their genetic codes will be 99.99 percent identical right the fact that we're able to sort of like push our thumb in and try to manufacture these reasons to make enemies of each other is like you know i mean i i did a um uh i did an anthology called the penguin book of spiritual verse uh where i was reading a lot of poetry from antiquity including you know the earliest attributable author in human literature is a sumerian priestess named enhedwana um and you read enhedwana and she's writing about man's capacity for cruelty and man's inhumanity to man and you read gilgamesh and the bhagavad gita and Padakara and mahadevyaka and you know like uh, the oldest writers of our species are all writing about the same shit, and it just seems like we haven't improved you know what i mean like it seems like we haven't we haven't made any, you know, we've made plenty of scientific progress, you know, like I can text my spouse, to, I can FaceTime my spouse tonight and that's dope. But like, it seems like as a species, we just keep like hard resetting into these tribalisms and barbarisms and savagery and just these bespoke mechanisms for cruelty. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that, like how we can advance scientifically, like, like you can pass along, like here's the recipe for, you know, how to turn grain into flour or here's how to make penicillin you can pass that along but it's not like a kid can come out and be like all right so here's where Kant left things and here's where Nietzsche left things and Heidegger and so like you can just pick up where they left off you know what I mean like like you have to sort of just come out and hard reset and we just don't do a very good job you know what I mean like we don't we we do such a miserable job at it and um as as hardwired as this sort of search for meaning and spirit or doubt or purpose or something in the hereafter or whatever it seems to be so too is this i don't know i don't know i don't mean to just i just i you know i don't have one lobe of my brain for thinking about like this stuff and you know sitting in front of a microphone and looking very fancy and like another lobe of my brain for thinking about what's happening and like so much of this book is about martyrdom and the idea of like a meaningful death versus a death that's illegible to empire and making meaning of like you know the the book orbits um there in 1988 july 3rd 1988 um the uss vincennes shoots the iran air flight 655 out of the sky iran air flight 655 was a civilian airplane 290 people on board were all killed including 66 children um, those of you of a certain age will remember the Vincennes incident, right? You might have to like scroll through your psychic Rolodexes to remember which specific act of imperial em empire atrocity this the Vincennes one was, but it was the one where 290 people were killed, including 66 children. Um, and after that happens, then Vice President George H.W. Bush, Vice President to Ronald Reagan at the time, um, says, uh, I don't care what the facts are. I'm not an apologize for America sort of person. Um, offered without comment. Uh, I comment on it plenty in the book. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, like, on the one side, on America's side, like, we just, that's the necessary cost of being a military superpower, right? Like, is it every now and again, you know, like, when I just told you that, those of you who had never heard of the USS Vincennes incident, which is probably most of you, um, it's not, I mean, I, just as there's lots of incidents that I've never heard of, right? It's just the one that I'm talking about right now. But um, none of you were like grabbing your phones and being like, oh my God, there's no way that happened. I would have heard it, right? Like, we understand that this is the sort of thing that happens when you're a global superpower, military superpower, right? Like we, none of you were in like utter disbelief that that could have happened, right? 
Um, it's like the imprecision of American justice is just taken for granted, is taken as a given. And but it's like if I had said 293 people or if I had said 289 people, right, it wouldn't have really made a difference in my brain, right? There's no there's no qualitative texture to that quantitative value. Like it sits somewhere between, like it's like a middle large number. It's more than seven, fewer than 20,000, right? Um, but that difference is, you know, three people, five people, one person, you know what I mean? That difference is massive, right? Um, the, the fact that that difference is imperceptible to me isn't an ethical failure of mine, I don't think, but it is an ethical crisis to me. And... And I think that, again, when I'm talking about Gaza or Rafa or whatever, you know, you see a number like 11,500 children killed in Gaza. And that's like an in, in I have no like that's like a pulverizingly large number. I can't do anything with it. Right. A pulverizingly large number. If it was 11,600. Right. It wouldn't make a qualitative difference in my brain. You know what I mean? My brain, again, not an ethical failure of mine, I don't think, but it is an ethical crisis. So one of the things that I'm interested in the capacity of art to do is to lend the granularity of specific narrative to a collective grief, right? So like this book, Cyrus's mother was on board that flight. That's that's how that flight comes into the book. Cyrus's mother was on board Iran Air Flight 655, um, and so everything that happens in this book, every joke that Cyrus makes, every lover that he takes has their life indelibly inflected by that act. Right. And so when you see that, when you see that, like Cyrus's lover, his entire life is shaped by that plane going down in 1988, you're like, oh shit, that, but like 289 more times. You see what I'm saying? Right. That's what I mean by the capacity, the, the sort of like narrative capacity of art to intervene against the the lack of qualitative texture to quantitative data right and so again like like this sets out to you know apply some amount of granularity to that 290 just as you know when you see the instagram video of the father reuniting with his child you know who uh who had they'd been separated in Gaza or whatever, right? You're like, oh shit, that's happening like tens of thousands of times, right? Um, and you're laying that specific individual granular narrative over the collective grief, right? Or, you know, when you see the person who can't afford their insulin and, or the person whose mother couldn't afford her insulin, and he's talking about how she passed because of, you know, this ghoulish necro-capitalist state in which we find ourselves, right? <laughs> that lends a granularity to what was otherwise a totally abstract quantitative sense. Does this make sense? Right. That is the, that is the representational capacity of art. That is the sort of like ethical project in which I'm interested. And again, that makes it sound very dour and heavy, but I don't think it has to be like, I think that, um, I think that you can be delightful and silly and fun, but still take your materials seriously. Thank you. Um, uh, I was going to ask this question later on because um, I have written my questions yeah, in, in order. In like lovely text too, there's underlines. Yeah, so because I wanted really to uh, walk through our audience through this journey with me asking this specific question, yeah. but I'm going to ask this question now. Now that you've heard how long-winded I am. <laughs> Because you talked about flight 655. Oh, yeah, yeah. So my question is, how much of a research has gone into this book? Because you are very specific about, uh, first of all, this uh, the flight 655 is very specific. There has been many things happen, has happening, has happened and has is happening in Iran right now. Yeah. But you went after this specific, um, you know, tragedy and also, uh, Cyrus's job as a medical role in the hospital, yeah. which I had no idea what was that job about. Yeah. And I thought, oh, how, how did you find about this job? Yeah. I, so uh, how much of a research you've done and why did you choose this specific? And I know that there's a plus, so you had to have her on the flight, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but still I'm wondering, there are other things that, you know, has happened. But. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, again, Iran Air Flight 655 has always interested me. Um, just again, I mean, 
I, I mean, and I, I could just write a book of sort of just nonfiction about that flight and also about the two nations reaction to it, you know, like um, in America, the Newsweek cover uh, for that week when it happened um, says Gulf tragedy. And then there's an op-ed by Henry Kissinger that says what to do about Iran. That's the name of the that's the name of the thing. Again, like a U.S. naval warship accidentally shoots a civilian Iranian airliner out of the sky. And it's Henry Kissinger writes what to do about Iran. Um, uh, a few years before that, again, those of you of a certain age will remember um, uh, Russia, Russia shot down, accidentally shot down a North, uh, not a North Korean, a uh, South Korean airliner out of the sky. Um, exact, almost exact same some uh, situation um, just a few years before, and the and the Newsweek cover said murder in the air, right? So like when Russia does it to Korea, it's murder in the air, right? When America does it to Iran, it's Gulf tragedy, right? Which is like too thumb on the like it's it's like artless how obvious that like I didn't even put it in the book because it's just like too thumb on the scale, you know? Like it's just like it's an interesting fact, but it's not there's no art in it. It's just like, of course, that's how it's going to be, you know? Um, uh, yeah. So I've just always been interested in it. And to be honest, like, I know so many authors who like, you know, I, I have a friend who is researching um, like nuclear proliferation for his fiction. And he's like, he like went to the Nevada test sites and like put his hand on the soil. And I don't know, like, I'm, I'm just a curious person. Like I just like read, shit constantly and uh and I, you know i don't have a lot of hobbies i just like reading um i'm a not very interesting person and so it's nice that i'm married to a writer who is also like into the same uninteresting you know like all of my all of my everything in this world is concentrated into this tiny little dot way out in the margins of human interest right but um but it it works out well um for my particular vocation um but i say this to say like i don't know how much like like I was interested in Iran Flight 655, so I read about it, but I wasn't like, I need to research Iran Air Flight 655 so that I can write about it credibly. You know, I just, I'm interested in stuff. And so I read about it. Um, yeah, and then Cyrus has a job as a medical actor in the hospital. Um, uh, for those of you who, uh, ha I was gonna say for those of you who haven't read the book, but it's been out for like two weeks. I'd be shocked if th there are those of you who have read the book. Um, but uh, yeah, he has a job as a medical actor in the hospital, which is a real thing where medical students um, practice delivering bad news to these medical actors, you know, so they so he goes in and these, you know, burgeoning er doctors are like, you're dying of tuberculosis or you're dying of cancer or we need to amputate your leg or, you know, like your wife's dementia is accelerating, you know, like they practice having these conversations with Cyrus and he has to like act they tell him like on a scale from one to 10, like how upset he's supposed to be. And so he dials it up or down, right? And that's his job, right? Uh, that's his job is he's just like an actor who gets told bad news all day, um, which is just, it's just delightful to me. I mean, I don't know, like, like of course there are like, in a book that is about Mar or largely orbiting martyrdom and how to create a meaningful death. And Cyrus is suicidally sad, but doesn't want to waste his suicide. So he wants to, you know, figure out if he should set himself on fire in front of a Bank of America or, you know, run into a crumbling building and rescue kittens or, you know, like he wants to figure out how to give his death meaning. Right. Um, and so there's some sort of obvious reverberations, but also it's just a silly, like, it's just a funny, delightful thing to put in a book, you know, like it's, it's like a funny, I don't know, like, I just like to have fun, like part of the fun of writing fiction is just like sticking your hands in the sock puppets and like making them talk to each other, you know, and, uh, and yeah, I, you know, I, it tends to be the case that if I'm interested in what's happening, then so too will the reader be interested in it. I'm sure they will. Well, um, with all the seriousness uh, in the book, about meaningful death, addiction, recovery, loss, and identity. There's humor in it too. When Roya and her brother exchanging like "Hak to Sarit" or <laughs> "Zahramar," <laughs> this really made me smile. Yeah. Um, and I could understand the humor while it being really serious. Mm -hmm. Um, also, the character who would sit on an old chair and watch Cyrus and Z while they were doing the yard work. I yeah. mean, I could just, you know, it could turn into a good movie, really. Yeah. Um, 
or the mounted rubber singing fish. I remember we had one back in Iran. That, that, that almost went on the cover of the book. That, really? was like, that was like one of the, I, ta I spoke with the artist and one of her preliminary ideas was to put a big mouth Billy Bass on the cover of the book. <laughs> it's a really bizarre object to buy yeah, and you know, put it on object. the wall. Like what a, what a perfect totem of America. Yeah. yeah. Um, another part that I thought was, and it is funny and I'm going to just, um, write this paragraph uh, is the story of the Babylonian 4,000 years old ancient tablet that you would think has some important information on message on it. But it was a lengthy complaint about a business transaction about receiving the bad kind of copper. And Cyrus called it ancient one star review. I thought that's really funny. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a real story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if you go to the museum, like, so, I mean, you, for every, like, Magna Carta or Rosetta Stone or, you know, like, Sliver of Gilgamesh that you find, there are, like, 5,000 just, like, disputes about receiving the wrong grade of copper or, you know, uh, like, just, like, the most quotidian, mundane bullshit that, again, like, is kind of... Uh, there's something like horrifying and also quite liberating about realizing that we just haven't evolved at all spiritually or like, you know, like, like we have just always been these petty little whiny animals, like obsessed with our own hurts, you know, and like obsessed with our grievances and like, you know, what we set to stone was like, I was supposed to get like grade two copper and I got grade one copper. And like, this is the artifact that, you know, like, again, for every like beautiful chip, of like stoneware that we've recovered. There are a thousand of these just like utterly, utterly quotidian and like, j just like, like legal documents, functional, you know, just like whiny, petulant legal documents. And it's liberating in its way, right? Because it's like, it's like, you know, if Catullus couldn't figure out how to make language move us ahead as a species, if, Hadakara and Mahadevyaka and Rapia and Sappho and Lipo and Hafez. And, you know, if if Dante and Milton couldn't figure out and Dickinson couldn't figure out how to get language to move us ahead as a species, then like Kava Akbar in Iowa City isn't going to be the one to do it. You know what I mean? And so like, well, and, and it kind of vents off some of that, you know, like I, it, it this was like a really important realization for me, actually, um, you know, in, in study, like I, I actually, spend a lot of time looking at these like arguments over the wrong grade of copper or the wrong grade of limestone or, you know, or like an insufficient quantity of limestone was delivered or, um, it's, it's liberating in that you realize that writing is, I mean, the Iraqi poet Dunya Mikhail says writing is not medicine. It's an x-ray, right? Like it shows you the problem, but it's not going to pick, you know, um, Teresa of Avila said, uh, God has no hands, but ours, right? Um, in other words, like you, you write the, you write the thing about empire and martyrdom and, um, you write the thing about, you write the poem for the unhoused in your community. And you don't say like, oh, my job is done. Like I've written the poem for that. Right. Like you write the poem for the unhoused in your community. And then you go buy cliff bars and socks and maxi pads and you take them to the mission. And that's how poetry works. You know what I mean? And like, and like, I think that, I think that that clarity was something that assembling that anthology really helped me with realizing that like the writing isn't what advances us as a species, right? The writing just points to the action, right? But it doesn't supplant it. And I think that, again, there's a lot of, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of, well, I don't want to just be talking shit, but uh, you know, I, I'm a little bit allergic to the sort of sanctimonious writing. That's like, wow, this is how we should all be right. And that's like, so, assured of its own goodness and it's just this kind of closed loop and it's like if you're like me then we're all then we'll all be good and if you're like them then you're bad right and I just I don't know I just don't think writing is that powerful I guess I mean it's not that powerful as a corrective it's maybe powerful as a diagnostic I'm, I'm sort of free associating and generalizing dangerously now um, and I don't want to be like tweeted in bad faith so I'm just going to stop now but <laughs> um, how much time do I have Okay. I have so many questions. <laughs> are we? Are, should we turn to the audience after that one, or is this like one last question and then like the cane pulls me up? Okay. Um. Okay. Call that thing where you know, like the side of this. A hook, a hook, not a cane. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So I have so many. I have so many questions to ask you, but because this is a, we'll talk after. But I really wanted the audience to. Uh,
to be here. But um, one last question. Um, during one of the Cyrus's visits to the museum, Orchidea calls him another dead obsessed Iranian man. Have you personally met Iranian men who are obsessed with that, or is it just based on a uh, general observation and what happened during eight years of war with Iraq? Don't you think that your American readers would think that all Iranian men are obsessed with that? Because honestly, I have not met any Iranian men who are obsessed with it, including my dad, my brother, my husband, and the people that death, death, death. 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 Um, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, it's a voicey. Mo so uh, in the novel, uh, Cyrus, in his sort of obsession with this, all, I'm, I'm like a I'm like a petulant toddler about spoilers. So I'm I'm comfortable sharing this with you, knowing that like even the me among you would not be too put off by this. It happens in like the first 20 pages, um, maybe 30 pages. But uh, but he finds out that there's this artist in Brooklyn doing this kind of Marina Abramovich artist is present esque performance of her own dying at the Brooklyn Museum. She has a terminal cancer diagnosis and she's spending instead of receiving treatment for it or anything, she's uh, just spending the final last couple weeks of her life sitting in a chair at the Brooklyn Museum, just talking to anyone who wants to come in and talk to her about dying. Right. And so Cyrus goes there to talk to her, right, to sort of speak with this living martyr. And she is also Persian Iranian. And um, and he tells her that he wants to die and he's writing a book about martyrs. And she's like, oh, you're another death obsessed Iranian man. This is a voicey moment for her. Like this is like her being sort of arch and glib. Right. And she's talking about, too, as you alluded to, during the Iran-Iraq war, the way that the Iranian sort of mm, necro theocracy that is has been in place since the 79 revolution, um, uh, the way that they propaganda is the idea of martyrdom, which was both a cultural idea and a religious idea among Shia Muslims. Um, made it so that I mean, this was the first war, and you know this, but I'm telling our friends. Uh, uh, the the Iran Iraq War was the first war since World War One to use human wave attacks, which is to say, um, if there was like a, a a field that needed that was like full of landmines, instead of laboriously going through and clearing them, they would just send out a wave of guys to clear them. Um, it was also the first war in which mustard gas was used since World War One. Um, but so and so like the Iranian government in sort of you know, they would arrive at your house and say, congratulations, your son have been martyred, your son has been martyred, right? Like this, the in, in this, this was this way in which it was, and then they would have these like great cemeteries of the martyrs where they would hire poets and musicians to go play. And they made this big production out of, you know, really taking care of the martyrs, right? Um, when, you know, again, like the idea of martyrdom sort of implies that there's some greater ideal towards which you are offering your life, not just like, you know, being conscripted by an army that sends you to clear a landmine or throw yourself over barbed wire. Um, and so this, but but there's also, again, among Iranians, this idea of Ashura, you know, is this day of national mourning where even secular Persian, you know, like we were fairly secular growing up and still, you know, I would wear, it was like a day of, it, it, hmm, sorry, it's like, it's complicated, but it like, it sort of ostensibly is there to celebrate or mourn the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, who is like the grandson of the prophet, which is important in Shia Islam. I mean, it's important in Sunni too, but it's like really important in Shia Islam. Um, he was he was martyred in the Battle of Karbala in AD 655, I think, on his birthday. Um, uh, and everyone in Iran on that day, I mean, you see like really, really extreme iterations where people are like self-flagellating themselves, walking down the street, just as you see like, Christians in some sort of Central American nations do like on Easter, like doing the crucifixion, um, like, cruci like, you know, whatever. Um, but even us, like as fairly secular, Mus as secular Iranian Muslim-ish people, you know, like my mom didn't eat pork except pe on pepperoni pizza, you know, like that sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, cause she, which she could never quite give up, but um, but we still wore black and like didn't listen to music or watch TV on Ashra. You know, like there's like a real reverence still that is cultural, right? Not religious, right? And so there, this death consciousness is both is I do think is something that you know if you think of like the great art of Iran, the Shahnameh is like beautiful, lovely 
men falling in love with dark haired girls and, you know, spilling their guts for them. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, there is a, there's a sort of cultural veneration of a certain idea that I do think is persistent, which is not to say that every Iranian man is obsessed with death, but in that instance, Orkida is kind of trying to make fun of Cyrus a little, you know, Cyrus is coming in all, you know, like high minded. And I'm like, I'm going, you know, he's like 28 or 29 at that point. And he's like, I am going to martyr myself for art, you know, and she's like, Ugh, another death obsessed around, you know, like she's kind of trying to like cut him down a size a little bit. Right. She's not, she's not actually making like a sweeping general statement about all Iranian men as much as she's like specifically trying to like be like, slow down a little bit and let's just talk, you know? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, do you guys have questions? Any Maybe? questions for Kabul? I saw a hand shoot up. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yeah, what's your name? Lori. Hi, Lori. Is that video uh, worth writing around? That oh, have you read it? Yeah. Oh, that's wild. We've spent a lot of time together, too. Thanks, Lori. Um, yeah, so to avoid another like lengthy expository backlog, I promise it's presented way more artfully in the book, but like in my trying to just catch you up. Uh, Cyrus has an uncle in the book who, again, when there are these human wave attacks, there are all these dead men on the battlefields afterwards. And, um, and you know, according to my dad, who served in the Iranian army during the Iran, and, and his brothers, there was a man in every, I don't know army words, platoon, uh, like group of guys, uh, who um, would at night put on a black cloak and get on top of a horse and hold a DC flashlight under his head and have a sword at his side. And he would ride around the field of the dead and like sort of pretend to be the angel of death, right? So that all the dying men would see him and be sort of like validated in their belief, right? Like they'd see this angel of death and they'd be like, oh, good, I was right to do all, I was right to give my life and now I can die manfully and full of conviction right um also in shia islam and most most abrahamic religions uh to kill yourself or accelerate your dying in the strict interpretation of the faith is to also sort of expel yourself from the hereafter or the good hereafter anyways and so um it, it was sort of this like intervention against like people who knew they were dying like accelerating it in any way um again a, my dad and his brothers who are prone to hyperbole insist that it's true. Uh, and that is where I heard about it. If it, if it was true, there would obviously the Iranian government would have never publicized it. Right. And so um, it lives in this sort of like Schrodinger's Valley of truthiness. And honestly, like that sort of like, you know, I mean, there are long dialogues in this book with Lisa Simpson and with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Rumi, you know, and I, I mean, like, the, like, I'm I'm not that concerned with like fidelity to the literal historical transcript of events so much as I am fidelity to mm, the psycho-spiritual reality of my unprecedented experience shining through the prism of history, if that makes sense. Hi, what's your name? John. Hi, John. Uh, as a poet, written novel. Yes. Um, and two books of poetry, two and a half if you count the chapbook. So, what is your experience out of this? Is there another novel that you're thinking about? <laughs> I just put this one out two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, reverting to type is a funny way to think about it. I mean, I've never. Like, it's a funny thing. I, I I teach at Iowa and I meet lots of young people. And anytime, you know, one tells me they're a poet, I'm like, one of me. And anytime one tells me they're a fiction writer, I'm like, oh, you know, like you go talk to one of that. You know, like I still very much think of myself as a poet. Um, there's no I mean, it's not I like I like it is like a sort of insufferable thing to call oneself. And I wouldn't do it in mixed company. But like I think of myself as a language artist. Right. Like I think of myself as like I like the way that that phrase sort of centers the medium and the materiality of language the same way that like 
you know, a ceramicist, you know, like the material is like foregrounded there, right? A painter works with paint, a language artist works with language, right? Um, I've been writing poems this whole time. There are 10, I think, or something like that, po new poems in the book in the voice of Cyrus, who is a poet who's writing about some of these things that he's thinking about. And he writes poems for Bobby Sands and, uh, you know, and, and Hypatia of Alexandria, you know, like historical martyrs who died not for a theological reason, but for you know, Bobby Sands case of political justice sort of reason and Hypatia of Alexandria for sort of knowledge, right? Um, uh, martyrs who died for something other than, you know, a, a, an invisible God sitting on a cloud stroking his gray beard, though sometimes that's what God looks like to me. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, but I've also, you know, I've also I've been writing love poems to my spouse this whole time that I've been writing this book, you know, like my spouse is also a poet. And, you know, I will I don't have any anxiety about writing things that I'll never publish, you know, um, I, I think that experience is a finite reservoir, but imagination isn't and language isn't. And so, yeah, I don't know. I, I just, I just write, I really like to write, like I'm an addict, uh, and of the highs that I haven't lost my privileges to, I basically have like caffeine and having written, you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, and I, and I, I get the most out of both of those. Hi, what's your name? Raren. Raren? That's a lovely name. I've never met one of you. It's Japanese, but it's like Dominic. Um, were you surprised to have this success with your first book, with your first fiction book? Yeah, again, that word success is so... Yeah. Shelf with this book, uh -huh. and, and now I hope you go there so I can tell my friends to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. That's generous. Yeah, I don't. I don't. It's weird. It's a weird book. It's not like a over the plate sort of like detectives and dwarves sort of. You know what I mean? Like it's like I mean again, like I'm not yucking anyone's yum. That's just not what comes out of my pen. You know, um, it's it's weird. It's like it's about martyrdom and like whether or not it's eth the ethics of like it's sort of like the vast trolley problem of like should I kidnap a conservative Supreme Court justice like is that ethical you know what I mean like um for real I mean like it's it's a weird it's a weird book right it's it's not so I, I certainly wasn't expecting it um you know to to whatever extent it is ha you know I'm, I think that as a you know the the fancy part of my life the part of my life that keeps my dog and the good kibble, like from the vet, the good like kidney kibble uh, is this stuff, right? But like my life, my actual life is like the hours of conversations that I had with the newcomers that I work with in recovery, where, you know, one of them was complaining to me about Tinder for like an hour. Um, and uh, which, you know, I've very, very, very happily been off of the off the market for like a decade, right? So I I don't really know about these reality these exigent realities, and I'm quite glad to not know about them. But that was also an hour where I didn't have to worry about accidentally killing myself, you know. And for real, I'm serious. And that's how sobriety works for me, right? That's how and that's how sobriety works for. I was gonna say a word that I'm not supposed to say, with regards to the particular fellowship that I am in, um, which by my sort of like. Freemasony jukes around naming it. You can probably guess which one it is, but uh, but uh, but you know, like the like that is my actual life, right? Like the work that I do in recovery and the work that I do in my various and sundry communities when the camera's not on me um, is my actual life, right? And so, like, I hope that this finds the people for whom it will be useful, and I hope that I get to keep writing. You know, I hope that I get to be alive long enough to keep making books um but you know the 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 baubles and the and the you know the laurel crowns and stuff like that it it, it is gratifying to me on the level of ego which i work pretty hard to keep pretty thin like a pretty thin layer you know like i for real like that is like a big part of the work that i do every day is to like keep that layer pretty shallow right I, I, so many of you have actually spent time with us. That's nuts to me. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. I think that um, are, one more, one more. Oh, amazing! How many of you have read the book? 
Oh, that's nuts. You, we've spent a lot of time together. That rules. Thank you guys so much. We've that's that's insane. It hasn't been out very long. It doesn't go bad. Like you guys can read other stuff. Like it's not. Well, I think I think that's a thing. I think a lot of the times nowadays people are like, oh, it's so timely or now more than ever. And it's like I think a lot of the times what people mean by that is like perishable. You know, like it's like uh, and it's not, you know, like, again, I, I got through quarantine by reading like and Hedwana and, Patico, you know, 43 centuries old poetry that was writing about refugee crises and man's corrosive impact on the earth. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Hi. What's your name? Barry. Nice to meet you, Barry. And I was wondering if the words were like music to you. No, it's really yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really bad when I read. I, I, so yeah, I, um, I, I like I, uh, I used to, I used to be a pack and a half a day smoker, uh, and like I just have a really strong manual fixation, oral fix. Like I just, I, I don't know. I used to be so like I've again, I've been reading poetry in front of audiences since I was like fifteen, and I used to. That happens to me a lot when I'm like stood and stood up and reading poetry, like way more than when I'm sat in a chair reading from a novel. And I used to be so self-conscious about it. I used to be like, like, I would just be like ripping the lectern and like, just like thinking about nothing, but like, don't move like a weirdo, don't move like a weirdo. And I recognize that as I'm thinking about that, I'm just like not present for the poem at all anymore, or not present for what I'm reading at all anymore. And I can either do one or the other, like I don't have enough sort of psychic bandwidth. And so I just, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I definitely like, I don't know what to, I mean, I don't notice in the same way that I've probably been playing with my hair this whole time. Like, I don't notice it until someone points it out or until I watch a video of myself and I'm like, wow, I play with my hair a lot or I, I wiggle around. Um, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the re like you're all, I assume that most of you are literate, right? Like you could all come up here and have read the first few pages of this book, right? The reason that you guys ask the author to come do it is because you hope that the author will be able to catch some spark off that initial sort of catalytic fire that led to those words coming into the world in the first place, you know, that, that, that energy that made it so that those words exist now in the world where otherwise they would not. Right. You hope that the author can catch some little glint of that in their recitation or performance or reading of it or whatever. Right. And so trying to be really, really, really present for, the language and to really hear it as if for the first time and not, you know, trying to understand it as a small machine made out of words and not, you know, the sort of like calcified ideogram that is just like, here is the unit that I give to you, right? Um, compels a certain uh, self abnegation, com compels one towards a certain sort of, um, I don't know, I went to Assisi a couple summers ago and I remember seeing all of this is a weird place to end things, but I went to Assisi and I'm no flavor of Christian, have never been any flavor of Christian, but I love the Bible. I think the Bible is full of great language um, and great stories. I, na I named my dog Galilee, um, uh, uh, but uh, which is a sea in northern Palestine and has like a lot of other resonances too. But, um, but, uh, but it also just tastes good, doesn't it? It's just like a delicious word to say. Like it's like a little tic tac of joy every time you say it, Galilee, right? Um, but uh, what am I talking about? A CC. Oh, right. Um, so you see these sort of Franciscan monks walking around everywhere. Amid, you know, it's a very touristy town now. Um, but amidst all the tourists, you see all these Franciscan monks walking around like checking parking meters and you know like just being very and the the utter unselfconsciousness of their devotion right like they're checking parking meters and then like 20 feet away you know you'll see like a group of them in like intense what one imagines to be philosophical or whatever the you know conversation and that sort of reverence towards what they feel reverent towards is how I genuinely feel about language and its capacity to be meaningful. And, you know, I know it has been meaningful for me in that ways, and it has been meaningful for many people that I love. And, and I feel that sort of reverence for it. And I aspire towards, I don't think I achieve it, but I aspire towards that kind of um, unselfconsciousness too, that I could just be wearing, you know, a robe walking around barefoot in a city full of tourists dressed in Armani, you know what I mean? Um, whatever the sort of literary equivalent of that is, you know? <laughs>